Bristol Island, and then somewhere around about the 1880s changed to South Island. And then officially we recognised that, whoops, it's always been to Upanama and we probably shouldn't call it both. And um, so I kept looking at naming and how, oh, I'm sorry, I've got to wear my glasses because I told this to print out at 14 point and it printed out at 11. Um, so <clears throat> the first explorations created a great deal of naming. So stories of the first explorations and naming of landmarks, boundaries and resources by a renowned tipuna is a feature of most pūrākau. Um, the first explorer sets out captaining, always a great walker, often built in the heavens, fighting battles with monsters or other explorers, because there can only be one, um, enduring, enduring hardship to traverse the land and discover name or create geological features on their journey. And in this way, the intrepid pioneer declares and defines the boundaries of the Takiwara of their iwi or tribe, and um, they sort of metaphorically throw a kōrawai. I haven't got the points where I click this on here, because because I printed this out two minutes before I had to be here. So I don't know if um, you uh, yeah don't follow it because I'm not either. Um, but that basically they throw a kōrawai of their mana over the land, um, and. They accept responsibility of the new whenua embedding their nomenclature, collective tribal Modi traditions and whakapapa into the lands in anticipation of later settlement. Um, Prendergast Tarina um, Iruera said um, a common dynamic in Maori oral tradition is to have early ancestors shape the land such, such as the exploits of Maui who prepared the uh, environment for human occupation. And to a lesser extent, this is also seen by early arrival figures who traversed the land, planting Modi, forming geographic features and spiritually colonizing the landscape for their defendants. So naming, um, actually I'm, doing, I'm doing quite well matching it at the moment. <laughs> um, naming confers the status of mana whenua and or local people, but in the Maori world, it means far more than that. Naming when done by a prominent leader or explorer is the step which sees the new settlers accept the role of kaitiaki for the environment of their new home as well as the resources it can produce. Well, that's a word for word. Okay, I'm doing okay. Um, the legendary explorer of the southern lands, now in the journal article there's a couple of others but I just can't fit all that into a talk, but was Tamaki Tarangi. Um, and he was captain of the Tairia Walker, and he was one of the many which departed the ancient homelands and ancient Polynesia. Can I just delete in your memory the Great Fleet tradition? It didn't happen. There were basically people going back and forth for probably two or three hundred years, and then at some point they decided um, when you go back, you can't go back, and we probably shouldn't. Um, so. The, the earliest people get the kudos because they get to go back and tell wild stories. Um, so he was one, so the captain of the Tairia Walker, Tamaki Tarangi, um, is mentioned as coming from Hawaii, not from Polynesia. And he follows the route that Kupe's wife, um, Kura Marotini, um, called Aotearoa and they head down the east coast. He becomes tired and hungry, as you do, and he paused at a peninsula which abounded in Kaimawana, such as Kina, Tipa, Paua, Tio, and fish of all kinds, but it was the coda which thrived in the region that caught his eye, so he fashioned basket traps. Some traditions have he immediately invented basket traps because he's an explorer and he can do things like that. And he caught enough coda for his group, built a fire on the beach, and cooked the feast. And in celebration of the event, those with him and everyone else referred to the locale as Te Ahi Kai Koda Atama Kitarangi. And um, all the fires where Atama Kitarangi ate crayfish. And I look at that and think, I would rather go with Te Ahi Kai Koda Atama Kitarangi than just, where are you going, Koikura? Um, 
to use the local vernacular. Um, so the story for the naming of Kaikoura and linking it to Tamaki Tarangi, um, it seems to have been lost. I, I looked on the Kaikoura uh, tourism site and I couldn't find Tamaki Tarangi. And I look and I think, we're missing a trick. I would rather visit a place named by a heroic explorer than a place that says Kaikoura. We go there, it's Kaikoura, eat crayfish, let's go there and eat crayfish. It sort of robs the myth the legend, the romance, and the excitement of the name. Um, now, one of the stories I enjoyed, Ira Hirawini um, of Moiraki, adds to this, and the Tairia goes as far south as Milford Sound, and he's looking for one of his missing wives. He's got three and loses all three, which is pretty careless, really. Um, and he comes across his favourite wife, who in none of the sources I could find was named, but um, it was his favourite wife, and he cried. Now, being an explorer, of course, his tears have greater power than any, fall into the greenstone and stain it. So that's how we get Dungiwai, Water of Weeping uh, Panamu, and you can see his tears as inclusions in the stone. Now, while he's stumbling around the fjord looking for his wife, the uh, kia kia, which made up his um, his rain cape, shredded and fell off, and of course, immediately, because he's a great explorer, grew, and that's why we have kia kia growing around fjordland, as you now know. Um, why do I make that point? If I was doing a landscape analysis around Fiordland, I would want to include this. Well, we don't. If we locate the stories when we're doing a description of why it should, for example, be part of the world, what is it, World Heritage Site or whatever they call it, I don't want to, sorry? That's it. I want to include the mythic stories as well because that locates that in the overall narrative of our country. Um, Similarly, uh, the, the Oahinaho um, name of Rapaki um, has a, an association with uh, Raki Whakapota. Now, did I include that into Waipanaui? No, it hasn't. Okay, we'll skip over that. Here, down. Okay. Tamaki Tarangi. Um, Sorry, I just, yeah, this is, we've had interesting times with our printers. We're just going to go with that. Uh, Tamaki Tarangi is exploring the new lands contemporaneously with another legendary figure, figure Tamatea Urihaya. Now, um, one of the things you'll find is that Tamatea, because he's got quite a popular name, Tamatea is still a popular name, he gets kind of mashed together with a, another Tamatea. So um, I'm trying to keep them apart but you'll find in some of the references that they're not. Um, and he's better known, he, so he hails from the Takatimu Waka, but he is not the captain. That was, the captain was also named Tamatea, just to confuse things, but he's not the same guy. Um, Tamatea Urehaya is better known under his later explorer persona, Tamatea Pokai Whenua, or, and also Tamatea Pokai Moana, Tamatea who circled the land, and Tamatea, who circled the oceans. And um, so he was circling the land, as you do when you're an explorer. And he went as far as south as Murihiku, then began the long trip north, pausing at Oha, um, Oha Amaru, where the, the uh, place became very, very stormy. Um, most times you visit Omaru, it's like that. But anyway, um, now, Explorers like Tamatea bear the fires of occupation with them. They're smouldering sticks. They're very sacred, and they are there for a purpose. And they are not just so that you can cook food from a smouldering source, but you are establishing ahika, the burning fires of occupation, the um, establishment of mana whenua by literally um, setting fires. And um, the ahika roa were smouldering pukuwa, tawhai, beach, bracken, fungus, which you carry it in a 
um, hollowed out log with holes drilled along it to control the rate of smouldering. And you have sand in the nest. So it was very scientific, actually, and clearly took quite a lot of uh, work to do. Um, I grew up in the Waitohi or Picton area, and um, I was always being told about travelling groups travelling with the fires. So you take your fires with you. Um, and the the guardians, the tiaki of such a, um, a fire had a really important job to do, um, maintaining the embers and being able to establish tiaki ka. So they get to Oamaru and there's some inattention and the um, koati burn down to the ground. Now, one of the more wonderful versions of this has they burned right down into the ground and then further down, and because they're explorers' fire sticks, they, of course, cooked the white clay, and now we have Oamaru stone. But anyway, which I like that. I, I love any additions to it, and I just ring my uncle and say, could this have happened? And he goes, stop asking stupid questions. You know, in the Māori world, embellishment is showing mana, not uh, enthusiasm outside of the original. Um, so <clears throat> they they have lost their fire. Their, their fire sticks have burned down, and it's quite embarrassing. It's a major loss of mana to do this because you can't light fires of occupation. And they leave their fire sticks behind, utterly chagrined, and arrive at modern-day Rapaki. Um, and things were looking particularly dire. They're um, sheltering under this peak here, and um, things are very, very cold. So Tamati Pokai Whenua knows what to do. In this case, you summons fire. So calls the atu ruapehu tongariru and ngarua hoe, asking for help. And here, and I had to delete a whole section of what will be in the journal article, Ngātuarōrangi, the great explorer of the north, was there at the same time, and instead of the Atua of the mountains responding, he does. And uh, Ngātuarōrangi, yeah, this hasn't been, okay, this is the wrong vision, but get to both. Um, he is the reason why there is the volcanic area in the North Island, but he answers so um, he's sort of resting from his exertions. You'll get to read the journal article and establish why he was so tired, because he'd been busy killing people. And um, he's on Tongariro. He hears Tamatea's karakia, and he goes, need to help the bra. So he immediately requests his sisters to Pupu and to Hoata to respond, and they change into fireballs, as you do. I have a sister that has that kind of temper. Um, and they rush across the landscape. They scoop out Whanganui River in the process, pause over Nelson, scorching the earth, which is where we get argillite, and um, then they continue to fly south, these fireballs. Now, the fireballs are actually, it turns out, baskets of lava, and I don't know how they change, but in every tale they do, um, they have so much fire that they're carrying that some of it sort of spills out in their enthusiasm. Because if you do the right cut of gear, your answer is always fulsome. So it spills out, and there's a small plain inland from the coast, and it's protected by a series of low hills um, called Maniarohia, and, uh, or the Plain of the Shining Tussock, and the fires enter the whenua, the lava, and drill down, and out of that, the water starts to steam and bubble up. And um, the tafaka, tafaka tanga takanga. Oh, sorry, this really should be bigger. Or te ngeru, or te ahe, or tamatea, or more typically te ahe, or tamatea. The fires of um, the fires of tamatea, and um, this is where we get the place prosaically named Hanma Springs. I've had people say, oh, look, it probably means something to the settlers here. Okay, let's look at Thomas Hamner. Never visited there. Can we be clear on that? He came near. He didn't go there. He was part of a survey team. He wasn't leading the survey team. Somehow his name gets associated. He goes farming, 
at the Conroy River and then eventually decides that Australia is a better place for him and leaves. His name stays. I'm sorry, but given the background of Te Ahi Otamatea, I really have a bit of a problem with Hanma Springs. I will say that the, the, that's the um, Historic Places Trust. The Hanma Hot Springs, known to the Maoris, were discovered for Europeans by William Jones. I always love that. It's like Māori lost them, we found them, and now they're ours. Um, so, but you've got to understand that Tamatea, so he's he's up and he's he's warmed up. The sisters carry on, they um, scorch Witch Hill, and um, and the fires also create Tahi or Tamatea here, which is right beside Te Ufuko or Kuri, um, and flow down into the sea. We get Quail Island, which has some scorch marks you can see around the coast there. That's obviously from fire, so this explains it. And we get at um, Old Tarahaka at uh, Waiake Stream in Teddington. So um, the area where he was revived is Te Ahi o and then it, they name it the Giant's Causeway and then Rapaki Rock. But we do have some remnants of the myth here in that this is Te Oho o Tamatea. So if you visit Rapaki, you'll find that thankfully one part of Aotearoa retains his um, memory. But Tamatea is not finished. He heads north. And he, Tamatea gets to a place he's with his brother, ends up in a fight, his brother dies, and he's really sad about it. A lot of people have turned this into a myth about a, a lover. It's not. This is his brother. His brother's dead. He's sad, lonely, playing a flute, and it gets named after that process. If you really want me to, I can say the name without uh, too much pause. But essentially, Tamatea, the land eater or the land circler, played his flute for his loved one, and it stays there. By the way, that's the it, it was on the Kenny Everett show. It was used in the Seek Employment website, and, and it's been in folk songs. How do you kill off interest in anything? Put it in a folk song. Anyway, Kahungunu, Ngati Kahungunu, fourth largest iwi in New Zealand, are directly descended from Tamatea. Um, Pokai Whenua, so very important person there. Now, so as big as these names are, they are nowhere near as big as down here because we have Rakai Hautu. Did you know that this area out here is Te Pai Pai, Tapu, or Rakai Hautu? I wonder why we've got no sign. <laughs> we have to echo uh, Rakai Hautu, and here we have Te Pai Pai Tapu. You know what Pai Pai Tapu is? The, the, Papai is the speaking area, Tapu, sacred speaking area. And anyway, uh, the, I'll, I'll leave our landscape friends to remonstrate with the new design about the fact that they are not acknowledging it there either. But anyway, his deeds, both mythical and real, left their marks on the landscape and in the names of southern regions. Now, one of the things you need to understand, he was real. Um, there are people who have direct whakapapa to him. Now, um, most people refer to the Ural um, Waka. Uh, that's its full name. And that is was wrought with sacred adzes, which were named. Te Whero Nui is very interesting because it's also the name of the Atua who basically is mischievous. If you think of the Norse gods and uh, Loki, uh, Whero Nui is the same sort of, so when Tane was climbing to get down the three baskets of knowledge, it was old Whero Nui who was throwing fiery darts at him to make him let go. So um, very interesting that it, the name appears as a sacred adze there. But anyway, um, it's the waka is um, made for um, um, Taita Whenua of, um, now, now Patu Nui Ail, I practiced that several times, and you still have to sort of do verbal calisthenics. This is a this is actually a Cook Islands name, which is why quite hard for Maori to say. Every Cook Islander I've known go there's that, but anyway, um, this is the lands that they referred to before Hawaii developed in the um, in the mythical traditions. 
So I often find that they're used inter interchangeably, but anyway. Um, gifted it to Matiti, who was the great Polynesian navigator who, in theory, was the person who sailed to South America to get the Kumara, so he's a good guy. Um, uh, Waiariki uh, or Ao marries Rakaihatu, and they get given the waka as a wedding gift. And uh, Matiti is the one who says there's a great world out there, you should go find it. And um, he strengthens the resolve of them by basically joining as the navigator and they leave and make landfall. Now, the interesting thing about this is they talk about arriving in Tukai Tokorau and finding people. And they are very clearly Polynesian because they are welcomed. They are told, hey, you know, welcome to the club. Um, stay here, it's a good place. And uh, they called in at several lands where they were taught to weave harakeke and, um, and to close cordage and rope, which will prove useful later. But they carry on sailing and they sail south looking for new lands. So they've been made welcome. Um, and so on board, there's Rakahautu, Wairiki or Ao, their son, um, Taraki Hauea, and uh, his wife, Takuiti, and Matiti, and various others of who will later be known by Ngaitahu and Waitaha Purakau. Um, there were no people, so the story, every single account of this has that um, the declaration is there were no people into Apanami. So I've had various explanations of that, one being that I quite like that Maui's only just fished, um, done the fishing up at the North Island, people are occupying there, the South Island, which is much colder, no one wants to live here yet. Um, so you'll find, though, that there is a declaration that is one of those, uh, it's kind of included in Mahi, it's included in Whakatoki, it's included in um, Whaikōrero by... Ngaitahu, and you'll hear them say, Rakaiatu was the man who lit, lit the fires of occupation on this island. And so he becomes central to the story here. Um, and the uh, oh, others have that he bought the cabbage tree and the fern root here. Now, so what you'll find often is that resources didn't just get found here. The one of the ways to credit the works of the explorer is to give them agency in developing things. So, uh, Rakai Hausu, we come down and there's some sort of bare land and he fixes it by providing food. The major source of um, carbohydrate down here was cabbage tree root and uh, further north the uh, ruhe or the fern root. So, um, and also the other thing that um, Edward Prendergast found was that he's credited with bringing some birds south. Um, look like that. The, so they arrive um, in, on the boulder bank, same place as my ancestors did in 1842, and they split up there, they said karakia, they planted a karaka tree, and there are karaka trees all over Nelson that the locals point at and say that was the one. And um, then they split and Rakai Hatu and Wairiki head inland and um, Turaki Hawaia and uh, Tapuiti take the waka to explore the eastern coasts. And so note that um, they're exploring the mountains and the other one's exploring the, the coast. We have a name for that these days. Anyone familiar with? Ki Uta, Ki Tai, and they are defining that. One in the mountain, one at the sea, and they're linking the two. So you'll find in most explorer traditions that um, that there is someone is looking in the mountains, someone's looking at the sea. Um, now, <clears throat> the, um, the, the waka rounds uh, Stevens Island and sails through to Mo Moana or Rokawa or Cook Strait and they come across the brothers which is so tapu. Now these are the these are the eyeballs of the feke that 
coupe killed. So they're very, very sacred. So you have to put on sort of a blindfold. You have to cover up the carvings on your walker and sail past without looking. And um, you, yeah, you, you sing a song like uh, the obstructions there by the coupe left in the world. So these are very, very sacred um, places. I like the idea of covering your eyes as you go past because it's so sacred. Um, and they get down to this magnificent site, Tapoe o Uenuku, north of the Kaikoura Peninsula, and they notice cliffs. <laughs> now, what I do, that you always have to have a heroic element, okay? So, in this case, you don't notice the many estuaries, beaches, low areas, they notice the cliffs and bluffs because that's what you do when you're an explorer. But they look and they they make ropes up. Remember, they were taught how to make ropes with harakeke, lower themselves over the cliff and gather up eggs, birds, and so on. And from then on, this coast becomes te patakai or akehoia um, or the standing food storehouse. So, um, so meanwhile, um, we'll, we'll come back to uh, the others in the mountains, but Tiffany O'Regan notes that they have found these birds and need to store them. So one of the things they come up with is the means to preserve what they caught. So right then and there, they invent the uh, Rimurapa bull kelp bag, which is known as the poha. And um, I... <laughs> I quite like that because it really annoys Ngati Marmoy, who of course say that it's their invention for the Titi Islands, and he locates it in Ngaitahu. So one of the things you'll find is that when you look at stories, we tend to do things like, this was our fella. And it's also, there's an unspoken second sentence, it was not your guy. <laughs> so so um, you just... You just do that when you're telling stories. It's kind of like Ngāti Tōa are more are better looking than everyone else, and that's plainly obvious for the rest of you. So, um, no reaction whatsoever. <laughs> Hannah, this is what I'm up against, mate. Um, so, um, progressing southwards, they um, are heading towards a reunion with the parents, and he brings the walker into each estuary he finds and sets up Po, to which he um, attaches hinaki or eel traps. And um, every time he sets them up, he catches eels, obviously, he becomes proficient in this. And from then on, it's kapopo, ate rakai hauia, and or teraki hauia's upright posts. So this is a statement, again, that establishes ownership that establishes mana whenua. So what that means is that every single estuary, of course, had a popo. It's just washed away for now, but it was out. So again, we're establishing we were here first, go away. Um, and um, he gets to the isthmus of, um, of Kaitoreti, and um, it's teeming, uh, uh, Waihora is teeming with um, with eels, and again, he names this for the fact that eel traps were set up by him. And um, again, we've got a statement of Fenua. Now, what I found is that um, that Tepopo o Terakoe Hoia is a name that seems to get down as far as uh, nearly down to Timaru and nearly up as far north as uh, Port Underwood. So it's sort of it's one of those names. Again, why would you do that? It's ours. You're establishing mana whenua. Now, think about the activities of a certain one of my ancestors at the time who was coming down saying, yeah, I know it's yours. We're going to kill you. And so when, you, when you've when you kind of driven off to Rapraha, you then want to reestablish ownership. So, again, you tell those stories and you shift where your label is north for convenience, and again, it's a statement of ownership. So, um, the uh, after his arrival at Fakatu, um, as his son heads away, Rakai Hautu ends up going overseas, and he's blessed with a magic digging stick, a core called 
to Whakaroria. And um, he starts his work and he digs out trenches. Now, one of the things, we used to be able to draw on this wall, and I really regret the fact that we can't now, but one of the things with a core when you're digging is you end up with curved lines in the, um, ah, no, it's all right. They can imagine my fingers with ink. Um, you end up with these curved lines showing where they dug. And of course, if you take a glaciated um, lake, then the retreat of the glacier is not linear. It actually shifts in parts and it leaves scoops that look like a core. So what you've got is an observed phenomenon and an explanation for it. The only thing is, instead of it being a ge geological process over time, it's a heroic explorer. But go with it. Um, so he digs out um, lakes Rotowiti, Rotoroa, and Rangatahi, and um, I'll let you, that's the three there, as his first creative endeavor. Because he created them, forever they're his. Um, and he carries uh, Whakaroria through his tour of discovery, and from there we get the Whakatoki, which we'll come back to how he dug out the lakes. He gets to, um, um, so Nelson Lakes he's done, he goes to Hokakura or Lake Sumner, uh, Whaka, uh, Matau, Lake Coleridge, and um, Oturoto, um, Lake Heron, and crosses Burke's Pass or Tokopi Opihi. Um, by the way, I, also, I fail to find why people are challenged by the fact that dear old Burke had a past named after it, already had a name, so why can't we use both? One of the things people don't understand in Te Ao Māori, we don't mind the uh, settler name. We just don't really like ours being deleted. So use both, use whichever you are happy with. If you'd rather say Burke's Pass, Ke Te Pai. Uh, te Manahuna or the Mackenzie Country. Do I look offended when you say the Mackenzie country? I'm a historian. I like Mackenzie. <laughs> Let's put him in jail. That'll work. Each time we'll put him in the same jail. What could go wrong? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> um, he scoots south, digs out Takapo. No such place as Tekapo. By the way, bug people up north. If you go to Kaitere Tere, you are not in kaiteri, teri. There is no such word in Māori as T-E-R-I. However, if you go to the place where the food was spread out lavishly, kaiteri, teri, T-E-R-E, T-E-R-E, you're in the right place. Why is that so important, by the way? Kaiteri, teri earned its name from an event that was actually post-settler, and that is when Arthur um, Wakefield who, again, my ancestor will sort out later at the Wario, landed there and he was welcomed by 14 rangatera. There is a monument at Kaiteriteri to the arrival, not of the 14 rangatera or the meeting, but that Arthur went there, and God bless him. Um, so <laughs> Kaiteriteri is misspelt, and it, the trouble is it completely ignores the importance of the fact that with 14 rangatera there, the numbers stack up if they had wanted to say, uh, back you go, and reinforce that with taiaha haircuts, they could have. So why not name it for that meeting? But anyway, um, they carry on down. They get to, he digs out Takapo, he digs out Bukaki, he dig, digs out Ohau, and then Hawea. Um, Hawe is a bit confusing because Hawe Akitarangi also is named as a separate people in some narratives. Don't expect us to agree on them all. That's why the Greeks don't. So why should we? So you get tired after you've done all this, all this uh, work. Digging stuff out is hard. So what you do is you pause and you say karakia and you teach each other about what you've done. Hence, you have a place of learning, a wananga or wanaka for the Kasimai Moi. Um, there's some people say it means o anake. The only trouble is there's no guy anake in any of the narratives. So by all means, suggest that it's that. You'll just be wrong. Um, that's okay. 
So they, they start jumping around here, they cross the Crown Range, um, and as one of them is stepping, now of course these are great explorers as they're stepping across, one of them stumbles on a boulder and pushes a rock over to create Whatatorere, or the stone bridge across the um, Kawara River, that of course the gold miners will later use. Later use. So there's an exploration for everything, and um, he names the, the mountains, he names the uh, saltwater lake, the freshwater lake, and so we end up with Whakatipu. Um, yes, there is an H. No, there's not anything as Waka Tipu, but anyway. They head south and they get, I oh, quite like this, they get to Tiana O, the cave of rain. It, he was obviously having a bad day, and then they get to Rotoua, the lake where rain is constant. <laughs> it's like, what's the weather? Like, it's a wee bit like anywhere in the UK, it's raining. Um, it's not raining at the moment, it will. You know, all the laws of rainfall on the west coast, if it has rained for three days on the west coast, it will not rain for any more than four more days in the week. Um, I'll just wait while the rest catch up. <laughs> They're older. Um, so, Rotu Ua has disappeared. Uh, there was a place, uh, Manawapore, which was actually North Mavora Lake. Somehow someone went, oh, it's that lake. And Rotu Ua is just gone. It's <laughs> So we now have Motorau, oh, the lake of a thousand islands, and basically everyone starts yelling at that point, so I'm just going to leave it there. Um, so they turn around, they look at Tarakiwa and turn around and head north. They Every so often they create other areas, Rotanui, Afato, um, Afatu, sorry is um, a wetland of some renown now and he keeps wielding his lake his coal and then he gets hungry and he sits down for a kai and they catch karai or petrels now i'm any monty python fans here so stormy petrel on a stick does renown yeah okay <laughs> those who don't know look up um, albatross sketch. Just don't do it now. <laughs> um, and they ate a karai, kai karai. So what do we do? Oh, that sounds like kai karai. And we have another meaningless name on our landscape. Create Lake Studham or, um, or Wainono and they meet their family there. And they have a feed of eels, and so now you will often hear uh, and I, I stumble over that because that's not the vision I learned, but anyway, this is the way our local mana whenua want it done, so katibai. Um Eel is the delicacy that belongs to the descendants of Tapuiti, the um, who prepares eel. If you were in my, were you there, Hannah? I'm so they, all oh, right. We had eel in my in my tikanga class, and there were a whole bunch of people who you could just about see their hand shaking, <laughs> except they came back for more. Um, they they head up north and they take root in Horamaka and um, they reach this wide flat landscape and here is where you'll get Māori arguing. Ka pāke, yep, ka pākehi, whaka teka teka a waitaha. The plains that radiate the preeminence of waitaha or the plains where waitaha walked proudly along or the flats where the Waitaha people dressed themselves gaily, strutted along joyfully when they saw the country was so level, or <laughs> hit and eat the seedbed of Waitaha. I just, it's, I am not mana whenua, I just say Canterbury Plains and duck out of the way, which is what you do if there's ever any argument. Um, but the um, descendants of Waitaha still describe Rakai Hatu was the man, Raki Hawaiya and Waitaha were the iwi. So poor old Hawea disappears at this point, but it's my Tahu's tradition, so who am I? 
Final two lakes that are carved out, Te Waihora and Te Roto or Wairewa. Um, and Te Waihora is so impressive. Oh, by the way, one of the lakes they found, they carved out was Waihora down south. The trouble is if you listen to those who are in the south, Māori of the south, so you don't have Kawaro, you have Kawara, and they shorten their vowels in much the same way as we have our own dialects. So you can spot someone from Southland. Māori were the same, so Kawara, So I will say Kawara. I did my PhD down there, so I kept with the protocols. But um, one of the things, where was I going with that? What was I saying? Well, I just, Waihola, Waihola, yeah. So they misheard Waihora as Waihola, and we now have the completely meaningless Waihola. Waihola should be Waihora. So they get to hear and say, Waihora, spreading waters. We can do better than that. This is now Te Ketiika o Rakai Hausu, which is the name of our dining room. The resources became so important that uh, another thing I'm working on, which is Tanifa, a Tanifa was left as a guardian monster to make sure people didn't do anything stupid. Um, those who are into your social sciences and sociology will recognise that what we have there is a clear example of Foucauldian crowd control um, observer functions and time. Yeah, like time is, what's the phrase out of Douglas Adams? Time is meaningless in space, it's more so. Um, yeah, anyway, okay. So he settled his creative journey, puts his, uh, climbed a high hill called Pugai and um, plunges Te, Whakaro or Te Whakaroria in the summit and names it Tuhirangi and somehow it's become Mount Osu. And Bataka or Rakai Hausu is the um, other name for the peninsula. So we can't underestimate it because you'll keep hearing the lakes referred to or any water referred to as Tupunawai Karekari or Rakai Hausu, the springs excavated by Rakai Hausu, and basically they are invoking this ancient explorer. Um, what they've done is established the fires of occupation They've established mana over Kitai, the margin of the sea, and Kiuta, the mountain regions, and everything between. They shaped the regions, they've dared to work the regions, therefore it, there is a real sense of saying this is our land. So when you are talking to mana whenua about anything, you, there's also the sense of these explorers embedded their Modi in it, and their Modi is caught up in the name. When we take the name off the landscape, we are also taking the mana and we're taking the Modi away. So, one of the things that um, I'm particularly keen on us using it is you won't find me agreeing with Keith Sinclair very often, but he says that the landscape, the names on the landscape, are a repository of long remembered history, mythology and imagery. And I think that's true of any culture, but it's particularly true of Māori. So we offer, uh, offer a mihi that connects us to the landscape and identification with the landscape, as um, Ailsa Smith says, I think beautifully, that um, it provides the means for hospitality, notes battlefields, notes resting places and so on. So, any questions? No, that's good. Okay.